Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode 63, recorded August 1st, 2012. Jeffrey Zeldman. Background I was uh, a journalist. I got fired from the Washington Post. I never found out why. Um, I was a musician. But I was getting too old. I mean, we we would, you know, right. We would we would be touring southern towns, and our hotel. We had a communist for a manager, which not a joke. He really was a communist, and it turns out they don't make good band managers. <laughs> you know, let's give that money back. <laughs> Those people seem to need it, it more than you do. Uh, yeah, pretty much. And so, hotel would fall through. We'd be begging for a room to stay in on, from the stage. I thought I'm too old for this. Yeah. So I had a lot of background, but I ended up in advertising because it. The internet hadn't been invented, and if you're a, you know, kind of a creative person, but you're not sure what you're going to do when you grow up, and you failed at a couple of things, uh, advertising, it was a place. Anyway, it was a thing. It's a job. Um, well, this a is job. Big, actually, let's let's uh, let's say that we've already begun the show, shall we? Were you recording all that? Yes. Because that was really good. <laughs> if you're just tuning in, this is Jeffrey Zeldman. Okay. who uh, has a, a little bit of a handicap. He has a master's degree in fiction writing and a bachelor's degree in English, which means he has no skills. How do you know this? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's true, but how do you know this? <laughs> research, my friend, research. But I first wow. became aware of you in ni- literally in 1998 with a list apart. And, okay. I, and I have subscribed and been a follower of a list apart since 1998. Good and it's Lord. so good to have you uh, on here. I follow you on Twitter. I fo- See, I, this is the amazing thing about modern social media is I could follow somebody like you and you have no idea I'm stalking you. Wow, that's very cool. I, I do that as well. Yeah. <laughs> no one knows. <laughs> that's another show, though, I think. It's for another show, yeah. Yeah. So uh, also uh, written, I can't think one of the classic works on uh, web design called Designing with Web Standards, which God knows we need. Thank you. Um, and that has uh, that's been around for some time, right? Uh, yeah, it's a third edition. The third edition, I uh, I asked Ethan Marcotte to help me, the uh, because he's a brilliant young guy, and he was he's the guy who pioneered responsive web design and things like that. And I just wanted to really broaden it out and you know catch up with where we are. It's a really interesting time as far as that stuff goes. No kidding. Yeah, with mobile and everything. Yeah. Um, you did Dan Cedar Holmes' book. We've interviewed Dan, and uh, the CSS for web designers is incredible. Uh, you've actually been publishing Aaron Cassani's book. Yeah. Um, so we, let's let's go back. We, so we started the uh, interview a little prematurely. You were okay. saying you were a musician, <laughs> and you decided the, you didn't yeah. want to tour. I was in the Insect Surfers, and we were. Oh, uh, I like the name. Isn't that a great name? It wasn't my name. I was. I came in late. I replaced. Uh, a bunch of people quit, and I was one of the replacements. Uh, it was a really great band, but um, I was a little too old to still be doing that. So, and I, I, I was writing for the Washington Post, and I got fired. Ugh. And uh, so I ended up in advertising. And I moved to New York because that was the place to go for advertising back then. And, uh, well, a lot of reasons. New York was a, a very different place then, and it was the kind of uh, messy dangerous place that I thought I wanted to live. Now I'm much more conservative and so is the city and I'm perfectly happy with that. But <laughs> It's grown up with I, you. <laughs> it's grown up with me. It it quit smoking, I quit smoking, like all, all that stuff, right? Yeah, that's a good point, you know. Yeah. So, um, uh, well, it, it, when you were, how long were you in advertising? About 10 years. Good and Lord, I, man. Well, I, I learned a lot about, you know, client services, um, learning the client's business, you know, did you um, do creative? Yeah, that's that. that I was a, a copywriter and art director. Wow! And, and got to work on some really interesting stuff. And of course, uh, I guess as we got into the mid '90s and then the late '90s, the 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 thing that everybody wanted to understand better was how is this internet and the web in particular going to change what we do? So, so in 1995, I was at an entertainment agency, right? And 
Because I thought, you know, if you can make a brilliant commercial for dishwashing liquid, how much more interesting would it be if you've got like a, a musician or a, a film or a great book or something like that? Like to make commercials for that kind of stuff would be more interesting. It turned out it wasn't. They were actually, they like, you know, making a, an ad for a movie means you put the actors' heads on a on a, bill, on a billboard. Billboard, yeah. Right, but... Um, but I didn't know. Anyway, Warner Brothers was a very interesting client of ours. And Don Buckley was the uh, marketing director in their, in their New York office. And he said, do you guys know how to... We're doing this movie about Batman. And we think there should be a website. Do you guys know how to make a website? And the agency president, Len Fogge, lied and said, sure, we do. And then he came and got three guys. I was one of the guys and said, do you guys know how to make a website? And we said, sure, we do. And, you know... And there, there actually wasn't that much to know back then. Like there was HTML and Perl. Uh, yeah, it was all we C hired CG. So it was CGI at the time. You didn't have PHP. You didn't have, everything ran in a separate CGI directory. And we, we actually hired someone to do the Perl, and you know we learned HTML. Right. And we how we did an animation of the before the, there was no Flash or anything, but we really so, we didn't know any better, and we wanted to make it exciting. So we took uh, an image of the bat. Right, and yeah. we basically we made it smaller and smaller and smaller. Then we did that in reverse, so it looked like it was coming toward you. And we used Perl to modulate between these still images, and so it was like before there were animated gifs. We made this animated bat coming toward you, and wow. uh, there were three million people using the web, and we had one point five million visitors, and that's what I wanted to do. I, I that's exciting! Like I, yeah, I yeah, it was great. Well, and it's perfect because the you had this kind of mix of skills that in an, in a normal world might not have been, you know, you wouldn't have been able to synthesize. But the web made the perfect place to synthesize the the visual, the writing, the creativity, the client service, the whole thing, and code, and code. Right, right. that was the new part for me. But like right. all that stuff, right? I still, it's still. I mean, there's a lot of generalists behind a lot of. Uh, the most interesting web and internet projects, I think. You've been called the king of web standards, probably because of the book, but but also I think you champion this stuff. Um, yeah, I, w I was definitely not the only person who did that. Uh, oh, God, but, no. Yeah, but uh, that label's kind of nice. I, sure. I like that. Sure. Um, the Let's see. Um, did that come from a practical need, or was it a political Issue it's you. absolutely practical. It was absolutely practical. Um, Netscape 4 came out, and it was incompatible with Netscape 3, incompatible with IE4, incompatible with IE3. And at that time, 25% at least of the client's budget went to just making incompatible, different proprietary versions Horrible. of the same crap. Right? Horrible. And, and very limited and... When um, when we started the Web Standards Project, we would approach some of the people who I really expected would support us were against us. They said, well, you know how much money I make knowing the five ways to right. go to site. And we said, you know, you could take that same money and hire a photographer <laughs> or, or a proofreader. How about that? Like you could spend that extra money making the content better. That made sense to us. And, and eventually that prevailed. It took a long time. Google helped in a strange way. How so? Right. Well, one of the things that we were excited about with, with uh, was Tim Berners-Lee's vision of the web, that it would be accessible to all. This, that was one of the things we said early on. This and is for everyone, he tweeted at everyone. the Olympics. And, and, it, and, it, and it turned out that businesses didn't really care about that. And if you said, well, you know, people's impression was, well, maybe some blind guy won't see our website, but we don't really but care. Who cares? That was, yeah. Right. We don't care. But then when Google rose to prominence and turned out to be the biggest blind user on the web, when Google said, well, you know, if you use semantic markup, they didn't say this. We figured it out and told people. But, but it turned out if, if your most important words were in your H1 headline and the next most important keywords were in your H2 and all that, people would find your content. And if you just put everything in a bunch of divs or a bunch of table cells it astronomically lowered your findability. Or so that, heaven that, forfend in a flash file. Right, right. I, I think that really 
hurt Flash. Oh yeah. And and there there are certainly ways of making Flash content accessible. And there were people like uh, Andrew Kirkpatrick, who really uh, who was at WGBH and and then at Adobe, who really worked hard to make that happen. Uh, but you know, it just makes more HTML just makes more sense for that stuff, right? Putting some words inside a tag, and making sure that that tama- that tag is you know that that a search engine understands that 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 tag is important. Like that's kind of the simplest way of getting your content in front of people. And you became a, you're a, kind of a proponent of the semantic web CSS. Uh, you really helped popularize that. You and Dan and, and the Zen Garden. CSS Zen Garden was great. Oh, the, the, I love that site. I think people didn't. A lot of people didn't get it until then. I, I mean, when I uh, designing with web standards, almost didn't happen, right? Because to me, we'd done the web standards project. The browser makers had said, "Okay, we win. You win. We'll put standards in our browsers." They were really working. There were people like Tantic Chalik, who used to work for IE Five Mac, who were really, you know, they were just as committed to web standards as we were. So that had happened, and when uh, Michael Nolan from New Writers approached me and said, you ought to write a book about this, I said, oh, everybody knows about this. He said, no, they don't. <laughs> you know, I don't know about you, but I, when you start publishing on the web, I had an inflated sense of how many people were reading and paying attention. Everybody read it. Well, everybody, everybody who mattered read a list apart. That's Everybody who mattered, right? So, so everybody knows. And uh, he said, no, everybody doesn't. He was right, and the book was very influential. Um, and so that helped. Geez, what was your question? Well, just the, uh, this, the, the rise of CSS, which you've kind of talked about right. a little bit. Right. But okay, also, great. and, and maybe we should define uh, uh, the semantic, semantic web. Okay. Because you that's a that. term I, people hear a lot. I can't do it. I don't know. What is it? You should know. Don't you know? It means different things to different people. And uh, there's some stuff that's kind of bullshit. Can I say? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. You said it just right. The right way to say it. Okay. <laughs> There's stuff uh, that's not so important or that's <laughs> kind hockey. of theoretical. Yeah. yeah. But we... Uh, but the notion... For me, it's practical, right? The, the notion that if you have... Here's a simple explanation. If you have a paragraph, put it in a paragraph tag. If you have a list, use a list... Use HTML for lists. If you have a headline, use HTML for headlines. That's very baby-ish way of saying it, but it actually makes sense. It affects... It makes stuff navigable to people with disabilities. It makes uh, people who navigate the web using older technology can still sort see your page's structure, right? They can see that a headline is bigger right. than your text. Uh, it does, ma- and search engines read the H1s first, then they read the H2s. That's the same thing that um, the software that blind people use does. So. Right. All those benefits, but what I wanted to say, I, I lost my, tra- I had lost my train of thought. But what I wanted to say was the CSS and Zen Garden was brilliant because there were still a lot of people who didn't read the book Designing with Web Standards, and there were still a lot of people who, after reading the book, I mean, there were definitely people who got turned on. But there were a lot of people who, I mean, Flash seemed so much ahead right. of anything we could do with HTML. Most of the designers that I know who were really talented. Were you doing stuff in Flash? It just seemed much more advanced. And the CSS Zen Garden was the first time Dave Shea's creation was the first time to me someone said, "Let's just take the let's take the the content, usually the content that comes from the client, and separate it completely from the visual presentation." Designers, you can do anything. We can take these same words, the same HTML. You know how you're constantly rebuilding pages just because the, a word changed or because the navigation changed? Look at this. You can make it look like anything. Dave Shea's CSS End Garden really made designers realize that CSS was very powerful and that the separation of presentation from structure, the thing we've been talking about in the Web Standards Project and in the Web Standards Movement, that that was powerful for designers, that that was empowering, not just for clients, but for designers. And I think uh, I can't underestimate how important that was to getting people to buy in to it, Web Standards. It's still there, and if, if folks want to see, kind of get an idea of what of how the separation of content and design can make such a difference, this is the f- default page when you go to cssgarden.com and then you can apply a design, the same content, but you apply a design 
and it looks completely different. And this is the beauty of CSS, is that you can do this. And, and without changing any of the underlying content. And uh, what a, I remember what a revelation it was to see this. Yeah. And, and it's still a fun place to go just to, <laughs> just to mess with it. Yeah. You know, it's just amazing. So, uh, yeah, and, and before Dribble, it was also a good way to find designers. Oh, yeah. Right? <laughs> the, <laughs> if somebody can, well, it, that became a showcase, didn't it? It's a showcase. Yeah. Um, I share a studio with Mike Pick now. Uh, Mike Pick and Tim Murtaugh. I love those guys. But how I dis uh, first discovered, I didn't discover him, but how I first got a whiff of, oh, there's this talented guy named Mike Pick was I saw his amazing uh, CSSN Garden contribution, which was all under the earth. And, and it was completely unlike a web page. It was just gorgeous and illustrated and dense and it's so neat. really amazing. Yeah. What is Dribble? Dribble is where well, you were talking about Dan Cedar home earlier. Dribble with three B's. D R I B B B L E dot com is a community of designers, um, web people, uh, and developers too, but mostly designers. Uh, yeah, you're looking at it now. And uh, Dan Cedar home and his partner, their idea was when you're working on stuff, it can be kind of lonely, especially there's a lot of freelancers, a lot of people working out of their own apartments and whatnot. And he thought it would be nice for people to share work. But, but there are ethics about that. You can't just say, hey, I'm thinking of doing this for my client. Here's a complete layout in their copy. What do you think? Right? But you can show 400 by 300 pixels. You can show a, a, like a piece of an interface that you're working on. And, just, and in so doing, you can show someone, you know, they can get a sense of the texture you're going for or a color scheme or, you know, a photo treatment or something. So you can convey it's like a perfume you can convey a little essence of what you're working on and other designers can comment on it and it's pretty it's it's an uh it's a kind of community that has grown through recommendations you can't just join someone has to recommend you everyone who's there can recommend up to five people it's, you know some people attack it and say it's clubby but but what he's been what what Dan and his partner have been able to do is uh, manage the growth of their community in a nice way, manage the scaling up of it while keeping the integrity, keeping it, you know, what it is. We're talking to Jeffrey Zeldman, a uh, legend in the web design a business is uh, e-zine, which was started in the, what, 98. Uh, a list apart is a must read for every web designer out there. And of course, he's uh, is a proponent of uh, web standards. Let's. I want to kind of maybe talk about the present a little bit. What is the state, uh, in your opinion? What is the state of web standards today? How are we doing? It's really interesting because, on the one hand, I mean, so so. Um, on the one hand, standard semantic HTML and CSS, uh, uh, you know, all, and JavaScript allow you to do amazing stuff that reaches people all kinds of devices especially with if you take a responsive web design approach you can create a site or an application that works that sort of conforms itself to the device whether it's an um this is the new hot uh, thing right is this responsive it design? is i i can't believe how successful and popular it's been it, uh, you know and ethan is marcotta creator very humble guy um has seems to have no idea he's just started this world revolution. I mean, I remember fighting for web standards for, for like a decade and having, you know, seeing very little traction in, you know, and, and make it was really hard to get business people interested. It was hard to get all kinds of people interested in it and responsive people who don't know anything about the web. They don't know what, what browsers are seem, I mean, are excited about responsive. They get it. They get that my content can reach people on all these things in their pockets, the personal computer in their pocket, the personal computer on their lap when they're sitting on the couch, the traditional per personal computer, the laptop, whatever. They get that. So on the other hand, the same multi-device world that we're working in is very frustrating and complicated. Um, there are 500 standard Android configurations. There are... At, there are two different definitions of a pixel in some Android devices, and I mean <laughs> that is a problem. <laughs> in, in a way, in a way, it makes this responsive device-agnostic approach 
even more compelling because you really, if you design with pixels and say, well, I'm going to make, you know, if you design for all the viewports that are out there, there's thousands of them. You can't do it. Right. You know, when there was an iPhone and one Android device and no iPad and, you know, and the desktop, you could sort of, if you wanted to, you could say, okay, I know what my fixed canvases are. But it's really, uh, there's a tremendous energy right now and a lot of rethinking. The other thing that's interesting to me is that, and, and this is not my original thinking at all, a lot of people, Karen McGrain, Luke Rubluski, a lot of people, really smart people are talking about this. To me and to them, mobile and all this kind of forces you, <coughs> excuse me, to focus on content, the content that people actually came for. Oh, shocking, really. Because... With, with, the, with, with <laughs> limited idea. screen real estate, with limited screen real estate, right, you can't fill up your page with junk. Right. right? We're, we're used to, as per, you know, at Happy Cog, any design studio, you go to the client and there's always some turf war involved, right? So let's say you're working on a university's website. There's 15 division departments and each of them yeah. wants to be on the home page and they all want fly out menus and... <laughs> Everybody, you know, and it, it's like that uh, XKCD comic with what people are looking for on, uh, you know that one, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you're always, and you're always sort of fighting to try to, you know, can we please have a little less of this stuff that nobody cares about and a little more of the stuff the user came for, but we'll, we'll hide the stuff the user came for. I have a, a demonstration on um, Roger Ebert's website, which I love. I love Roger Ebert. He's a great writer, great movie reviewer. But something like one sixteenth of the page uh, is devoted to his writing, and the rest of it is all this junk that you know the people who own the newspaper, right. and all this irrelevant stuff, and th that's standard now. We've with all our sidebars and with our delusions that well everyone has sixteen hundred by nine hundred now, so we can just fill it up with more and more and more junk. All of a sudden, you've got like a three hundred pixel wide canvas, and what that does. Here's so the, web stand right yeah <laughs> right <laughs> things on the front page of a university okay. website things that people go to the site looking for and the only intersection of those two sets is the full name of the school <laughs> exactly i love that but that's what that's that's been the history of of web design over you know on the desktop in the last 10 years and now with mobile you can you know maybe fit the full name of the school in the screen so yeah. you actually have to you have to go to what people want because you don't have real estate. There's right. uh, Luke Rabluski does this beautiful demonstration of Southwest's website, you know, on a phone where it says, you know, is my flight on time? Book a flight. You know, a couple of buttons like that that let, let you do the things that you actually came to their website to do. And then when you went to their desktop website, it was like flash movies with our exciting <laughs> partners and, you know, theme songs and contests and all. You know, because someone in marketing figured out they could make money by partnering with this one and that one. And you understand why all this stuff happens and makes sense. Someone's got to find a way to pay for all this. You, that makes it. But, uh, you know, but with mobile, there's this, it's forcing you to. Content, rethink, function, these things. Usability. Usability. They're, they're, now, it's interesting because I, I think these, by the way, if you go to zeldman.com, uh, Jeffrey's website, perfect example of. Beautiful content focused, big text, you know, it's great. Uh, I think of Om Malik's uh, personal site, om.co, which was the first, I think, responsive uh, design I was aware of. And it's just, it focuses on the content, but it's no less beautiful. Yeah. It's no right. less gorgeous. But I do wonder when you, you know, if you design for the small screen, do you lose out on the big screen? Or is this really what people want everywhere? That's the theory, the content first theory. So. <sighs> The contest first theory is if, and, and I first heard Jeremy Keith articulate this, right? Who's a, a really brilliant British guy. Um, he said, you know, so the theory is people want all this junk on the desktop. And, you know, no, people want the context is different. The mobile context versus the desktop context is different. But in every case, people really want the content they, they want. I, I go to Roger Ebert's website to read his stuff. Right. So that other stuff should be kept to a minimum. If you're really smart, you can perhaps tuck away two or three things. This uh, um site looks like uh, readability. It's very influenced Isn't by it gorgeous? the design of yes, readability. You can tell. It's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And as is mine. Right. I, as I, it should be. And, it, and readability, which 
it was a uh, a tool that people used to clean up these crappy sites so you could actually read them uh, was created because users wanted that, right? This is what they wanted. Right. They actually had to develop a tool <laughs> to take the crap off uh, of websites. Yeah. And yet and every website, and ours included, you have uh, conflicting needs because we also need to show you banner ads and and we want to somehow find a way to show you all the content we have, all discoverability, all this. It's a very great challenge. Do you think it that is this a great is, challenge? Do you think this is what Microsoft has been influenced by with Metro? Metro is stark. I what I think is brilliant about Metro is, and is superior to. I mean, with the iPhone, I look and I see a bunch of buttons, which I love, right? But I see the app, I see the um, icons of the apps that I'm going to use. Right. But with Metro, I see, oh, there's a picture from my cousin. There's actual I'll, content. I'll open it. There's content. Right. Again, it's content first. It's visual, not verbal. It's this, but it's the same thing. Content first. It's a content focused interface, which I think is amazing and wonderful. I think a lot of more, we're going to see more of that. They also have eliminated rounded corners, drop shadows, skeuomorphic design, all the things that be, all the cruft that we accumulated over the years as uh, good design. What do you think of all the leather and the stitching that Apple's putting into OS yeah, X, for I, instance? Their theory is that it helps people understand what they're dealing with. And, you know, some of the things that they do, it's fairly successful. Other things are kind of horrible. Um, I was opposed to it for a really long time. I, I was... Uh, and this may just make me a bitter old man, but I, I had a hard time when Apple switched from classic to uh, OS X. It took me about five years to stop hating OS X and actually appreciate it for what it is and love it. But at first I was like, wow, so wait, so I need a lot more memory now so I can see all these drop shadows. <laughs> I mean, I, I was... I just I, wonder what this little remnant residual page that I've supposedly torn off on the calendar does to help me in any way. Yeah, I. I mean, I guess it's a. It's. I don't even want to say it's pretty. It's, I I don't want to say it. it's a fad. It's a, it is a fad. The, it's a fad. The, remember, this is Spinal Tap. <laughs> and then, yeah, the the driver is a big Frank Sinatra fan, and and <laughs> he's talking about Frank and the band rudely, like they raise the windows, so they don't have to hear him, and he, he turns to. Uh, he turns to the phone and he says, I, I don't want to say that, but this is a fad. <laughs> this rock and roll thing. That was Bruno Kirby. Rock, that's right. Fad. Yeah, Bruno Kirby. <laughs> this rock and roll thing. But, I, you know, <laughs> but isn't, but you got to go admit, away. designers are very influenced by trends and fashion and style. Sure. And, there are, and it's really interesting. I think we are. A lot of designers hate the skeuomorphic stuff. I mean, I make agree. jokes about it. And that's why I think, I, I have to think that Microsoft, the designers in Microsoft are saying there's going to be a backlash and we are going to create the cleanest simplest, and I'm not just talking about you, you it sounds like when you're talking about Metro, you're talking about it on the phone, but even on the desktop with Windows 8. They're going to look modern. They're going to look gonna modern. It's going to look modern because it's clean. Right. But then there's right. the, then the, the pendulum swings, does it not? Sure. Sure it does. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, people, I always think that style, is, you, know, you have to do something that indicates you know what time you're in, but you don't want to overdo it. Um, Alfred Hitchcock was actually brilliant at this, the filmmaker. He would costume his people as timelessly as he could so that when a when an audience in 1960, whatever, watched North by Northwest, they didn't say, why are people wearing these strange clothes? But they also, I mean, you look at some old movies and the clothes look funny, the hats and everything. Mm -hmm. They're very, you know, they're very much of their time and it dates them and makes makes it harder to relate to the people like oh wow so that's what grandpa thought was hot <laughs> oh you look at michael douglas in wall street versus, right there you go versus jimmy stewart in rear window and that's you, you, you it's very interesting yes. i never knew that jeffrey but you're absolutely right there's a timeless quality and so uh, I, I mean it was it was of its time but it was he really understated that so yeah. i i think that's a good design principle if you can do little things that reflect yeah i know it's 2012 but not go overboard. Perhaps it's because Hitchcock, with the huge ego, believed and knew that his films were timeless and would last beyond him. Maybe and, that. And many maybe. designers probably figure out oh, we're just doing <laughs> this is just this is ephemera. This is trivia. This will be gone in a year anyway. Well, it, it is. I mean, when I think about architecture, right, I think about the courage it takes to make a building. No kidding. 
people are going to be stuck with that for maybe several hundred years. No kidding. And if it's bad, if I make a terrible website, I, I mean, it's serious. It could have serious repercussions for the client and their business. So I have to take it seriously. But not for long. At the same time, <laughs> the skin of it, right. Ultimately, so, you know, we when we redesigned at Happy Cog, when we redesigned uh, WordPress, like two months later, it was redesigned again. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's just the nature of it. So... You take your best shot and it's, you know, the web is never finished. That's kind of the great thing about it. And it's a wonderful playground for ideas because you can keep experimenting and you can fail a lot and still, I mean, I'm proof of that. You can fail a lot and still be considered successful. <laughs> I, do you see, don't know. I do see that the, 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 uh, every, uh, designers get very much influenced by other designers and they are become trends. And now they're, and I'm just looking at WordPress.com and it reminds me of Pinterest. There is the the Pinterest look now, the squares with the with the things and the and I guess in some ways this is also so WordPress looked like WordPress looked like has looked like that for a while That's actually. True. So That's true. So that maybe Pinterest but, is copying them. I I just sometimes there's things in the air, don't you think? Yes. A time an idea whose time has come. Pinterest in a way is is like Metro. Well that's exactly what I'm thinking, that there is this thing. Squares and no rat and it, it almost feels like uh, a reaction to uh, the rounded corner. We got so into rounded sure. corners, it's like, God, no more rounded corners. Well, now now we actually, uh, now we can do them in CSS. <laughs> I know. Right? We spent 10 years, <laughs> with, people used to write articles about this. You know? I remember. To, I think right? I think Danny Cederholm, I remember very well reading an article on how to make a rounded corner. It was a lot of work. <laughs> Doug Bowman uh, had a brilliant way of making around a corner. Called, you know, uh, what was it called? Sliding doors. Sliding was, doors. That was it. Him. Was mostly semantic. It was mostly semantic, right? Mostly. There were just there were just like eight extra divs or something like that. And but uh, you know, we were all very happy. And uh, now that the CSS supports it, it, it'll go away. Let's talk about JavaScript. What's your opinion on okay. that? Uh, it is a wonderful necessary standardized tool for adding behavior to websites and the the trick with javascript like with everything else is I, i'm a big proponent of progressive enhancement which means you make a site you make or an app you make something that works in any device that understands html so even if you're going to have really fancy you know javascript for people using modern browsers or what have you uh there's there's a basic version that that is just you know that uses forms right so so it'll work on a newton <laughs> right no, no I, you're right it, tr a, td the newton understood the, we have a, a friend who um splorp uh who every time we do something he sends it to us on a newton here's how it looks on my newton good work guys they're you out know, there and and I mean, he, I mean, he knows he's a collector. He knows it's an archaic. But I think platform. it's interesting because he's using. He's saying, "Look, it's got to look good on the most primitive platform, all and it, and look better." It of course, something. Yeah, if it works on something, if it works on something, right. and it's a decent experience on on a platform that was discontinued ten years ago, then you're doing something right. So you you build up from there with progressive enhancement, right? So ultimately, with JavaScript, you can have all kinds of carousel effects and and things opening and closing and changing shape and all that. And you can, you can get into the same silly territory we got into with Flash. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a big fan of that. I think simpler is better. I think, because uh, again, I think people, I think good design is somewhat unobtrusive and it lets the right user find the content they came to find at the right time and do what they came to do. So, uh, I, I mean, I like a little sex in my interface too. You know, we all do. So, JavaScript can be um, overdone, but regardless, um, I think for responsibility is the first, is the bottom line. If, if even if you have some elaborate JavaScript construction for the person with the you know high you know fast bandwidth and you know modern browser on a desktop, still you start with the progress from progressive enhancement. You start with that baseline experience that right. works for anyone, and and you know, and, and, um, I think with mobile. Uh, where again we have to think carefully about everything that we do. Even, we have to think about even the new bad. Here's a Splorp's 
slideshow of HTML5 on Newton, by the way. <laughs> Go. God bless right? him. <laughs> right? It's amazing, right? It's amazing. This is Apple. Apple's actually doing a good job. This the... And this is the Apple homepage? Yeah. Because it's it's semantics. It, it, it's, there's there's, there's semantic, semantic markup. On... It's semantic markup. And that's why when you ask what is... When, when people in the chat room say, well, semantic, what, what does that mean? And why is that important? That's why it's important. It's it's too bad that it has that name because it's there's something it's, name. Acad- it's very academic yeah. sounding yeah um, and then there's, there, yeah but are you glad Flash is dead I don't know that it's dead uh, I'll tell you I'm I guess <laughs> a little uh, I felt like an idiot in the nineties when my friends were designing much cooler looking stuff than I was. And I was going, no HTML, the CSS stuff. They're gonna, they're gonna make it work in the browser. Look, I know I can't really control the spacing, but it's gonna get better. I, I felt like I had bet on the wrong horse, and but I was. God alone. bless you. You didn't give up, did you? Too stupid to give up. Too dumb to quit. And you didn't uh, go learn Action Script or whatever the hell it was called. You didn't. I found it really difficult. I I would do it when a client required. I mean, what Happy Guy was originally just me. So when it was just right. me, I had to do everything. And uh, I had Hellman Curtis's book open, you know, on my desk, going okay. Yep. But I, I would yep. fourteen hours to make some letters move. <laughs> right, it was fourteen hours of labor to make, and it was a nice effect. The letters kind of came on, and it was pretty. And I'm sure, you know, Josh Davis was doing brilliant stuff with Flash, and now he's doing it in HTML5. But but he was, a, he was an artist. He's really a fine artist. He has stuff on, on you know, he's a, he's a really brilliant guy. There were definitely Matt Owens. There were, there were some really great studios doing amazing stuff. I just felt dumb and like I was using bad tools. But the tools got a lot better, and the stuff we're doing now is really amazing. And, you know, I look at it, it would... Um, we, we just, you know, we just put together a carousel and it was all, and all this animation and everything is just CSS. There's so almost cool. no JavaScript. And, yeah. and on, you know, if someone's using IE8, they get all the content. They just don't have this nice smooth glide up or, and down and they don't miss it because they, you know, nothing does it smooth up and glide, and glide for them. And it's exactly, okay. Because they're using IE8. <laughs> one, of, one of the most important, one of the most important websites is, uh, I always get the name, the URL, but the URL is something like, do websites need to look the same in every browser.com? I, you it need to look exactly, do it's do, do websites, websites need, need to be experienced exactly this? If this is a ridiculous, nope. <laughs> the answer is simple. But, do websites but, need to be experienced exactly the same in every browser.com? This is by Dan Cederholm, and that, that nope answer looks different depending on which browser you're using. Right. You he can tell I'm using it. Safari. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So um, I have to say that there yeah. are there are a lot of things in technology and life that make me despair for the future of mankind. But one sure. thing that actually makes me positive and optimistic is HTML5 and the move to web standards. I actually feel like we're moving in the right direction. I agree. I agree, and and I think. Uh, and this and this doesn't mean that there isn't a place for native apps because there definitely is, and there's some things they do much better. But the idea that there's this simple standard platform that's adapted, it's like the cockroach that will survive the nuclear war when yeah. we don't. Yeah. It's very simplicity means it will it, we don't know what devices are coming down the pike in ten years or five years or twenty years, but we know that you know Project Gutenberg will still work. We know that all the stuff that we're publishing now, it will still work. And there's really something to be said for that, whether it's Silverlight or Flash or any of these plugins. If it required that, that's guaranteed you're going to break something in 50 years. There's just, there's, right. no, it's like saying, here, let's put it on a zip drive. That'll live forever. It's just not going to. But yeah. semantic markup, it just, it, it, it's, it's going to live. And that's so important. We're, we're putting stuff online now. That is our cultural heritage. It's our future. It's it's what people are going to want to read. We need to make sure that they can read it. We uh, still need to print it out. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> you know? Yeah. In case the... Hard drives don't live forever. I'll tell you, I was... Uh, for a while, I was sharing office space with a 
publishing startup and the problem, and they had great technology, but the problem was the people running it, they were very experienced print publishers. And they didn't, so they would, they would look at their magazine in printouts only. They, they were making something that was designed to work in iPads, phones, netbooks. That's what it was for. Right. And it was using this technology to create a magazine experience, right. but just using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Right? So no much of that. There's a ton of that out there. Yeah. And then they, they would print it and look at it and go, I'm not sure this is working. And like, nobody's going to see it like that. <laughs> They're going to see it on a screen. And you know what? They're going to turn the screen sideways and something's <laughs> going to happen. Are you prepared for that? They didn't know. They didn't know. So... Yeah, there's a there's definitely. Let's sometimes talk about. You, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Sometimes, you, you know how sometimes you think like, well, there were the racism will only ever really end when all the racists die, and or like you know we're all one gray blob, right? So it's it's kind of like, you know, we're the last of the stupids. My 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 seven year old is like the, is the future. Like those kids God, are I growing so. up with this stuff. They're. They understand touch interfaces. It, I mean, and I, I, my dad's a brilliant guy. He's an engineer. He's very smart. But my dad has to go to the Apple store to take lessons on how to use a touch interface. Yeah. They, you know, and and a three-year-old gets it. A three-year-old just uses right. it. Right. Your they dad's use, mind was polluted by DOS. Right. Exactly. He misses DOS. He misses the <laughs> command line interface. I need a batch file. Yeah. So... Let's talk about tools, because I know that the, everybody watching is saying, all right, well, what does the great Jeffrey Zeldman use when he does these amazing things? Uh, tell me how you, tell me, you're a Mac, PC? Mac. Uh, do you Mac. use, are you using, are you paying attention to Retina? Does that matter to you? <sighs> we are as a studio, I'm not as a designer, I don't really, I think, uh, I think it's interesting that I think there's... Okay, so this is going to be a little bit more complicated of an answer. With responsive design, you want to send a small image that loads fast to a mobile device with a small screen, and you might want to send a larger image to a bigger screen, and you perhaps want to send a retina-quality image to a retina-quality device, but you don't want to go back to the old bad days of browser and device detection. That's just bad. You don't want to do that anymore. No, and no JavaScript what, code saying what is your browser? What is your user browser? Agent? Because they, and, they, and the user agents lie anyway. Opera says it's they IE, do. and you know, right? That, that that's known. That's been known for years. Capability detection is good. Okay. Device detection is bad, but but you can't always. You can't tell if someone's on. Oh, they're on. Th they're on four G. So I can send them this. Right. But they have a real. Do they have a good 4G connection? <laughs> right. Are they about to go down to the edge network? He, there's so much you don't know. Right. This guy's on mobile, so he probably is in a hurry. Maybe, or maybe he's actually reading on his iPhone at home where he has right. very fast access. You don't know. So Apple, and I love them, but they do a very, I think, very stupid thing right now, which is that they are serving retina images. Every image on their site is a retina image. Regardless of the device. Regardless of the device. So that means when I load over my 3G AT&T connection on my phone, I have to, you know, and my phone is a retina device, but you know what? I wouldn't really care. I will put up, uh, I came up like blurring the background of JPEGs and, you know, going, you know what? The medium quality is good enough. And, you know, as long as the, as long as the eyes and the teeth are in good focus, <laughs> nobody's going to notice the rest. It's true. It's in true. Fact, sometimes we don't, we don't want to see the pores, really. And we don't, right. Okay. So you know about that. And, and, and Apple, I mean, I get why they have to do it or they right. think they they're have marketing to do it, but, it. They're selling it. Come on. But so this means that there's a whole lot of people having a, you know, waiting forever for an image whose quality, whose advanced quality they can't Should see. we even as designers think about bandwidth consumption too? I mean, shouldn't we think, shouldn't we think about all the wasted bandwidth or is bandwidth yeah. infinite? And who no, cares? bandwidth is not. In, I mean, as you know, we're, so it's a mobile world half the people are connecting on their mobile device at any given time to your to your site and that means you know i'm uh, i have verizon and at&t accounts i like both companies but they you know they can only do what they can do and sometimes they get overloaded 
I don't know if you remember the South by Southwest where nobody could connect. <laughs> yes. Right? It was a few years ago. And yes, I was there. AT&T, okay. The next year they had trucks in the parking everyone lot. Had, the everyone had, right. Everyone had their new iPhones and they were all helplessly like, you know, like. It's horrible. Uh, right? It's horrible. It was, yeah. Okay. So I, and this is the thing on the, uh, and you, you can't turn back time. You can't put the genie back in the bottle. Um, you know, you couldn't, uh, you know, you couldn't make Flash go away when it came out and you couldn't make designers go, you know, you couldn't say to a designer, you don't really want that type of graphic control because the designer did want that type of graphic control. So the retina is here. I don't know how many devices and, and, and Android devices have had that capability before. They just didn't market it. Right. They didn't they didn't call it retina. Uh, but. It's not going to go away. So we have on the like uh, this is a really I mean, we're being torn in all directions right now. And this is why it's such an interesting, exciting, and challenging time. On the one hand, people are coming for content first, and they may have five seconds to look look something up while they're standing in line at the grocery store over a 3G network that's only partially functional. And on the other hand, they may have a retina device, and they may want us, and you don't know. And it's very, you know, people. We talk about context, but it's a very fuzzy term. Still, you really don't know the context, the use context, most of the time, and you don't know the capability context most of the time. So it's very challenging. How can you create a great experience for everyone? One of the things, I mean, if SVG, yeah, scale, if really we're scalable. Yes, if SVG had really taken off and it was natively supported in browsers, just the same way JPEGs are, then that would be, it wouldn't do for photographs, but it would help a lot, you know, if all my buttons. Uh, right. A lot of things, we'll have questions, we'll, we'll talk about, should we wrap an extra, or an extra span around something, even though it's not semantic, and then let CSS create that gradient so no one has to download that gradient background image? Or should we stick a gradient background image in there knowing that some people are going to have slow connections and every and on mobile, every HTTP call is, a, is another hit, another performance hit. So, so what do you do? Then there's no... Wow, that's know, an there, interesting question. Right, so it's all, it's all like that. That's a tiny detail, but everything's like that right now. It's really interesting. Um, what I tried to do with my redesign at Zeldman.com was bypass all of it and just go and literally go, I'm going to make one design that works for everybody. And it's and very you know, text heavy, which solves a lot of problems because for at, me, at least text yep. scales, right? And, and, and I uh, are you using Google scales, fonts? Are you using? I'm using uh, actually, I'm using um, don't embarrass me now. I, why am I? Is it one of these font systems where you load in? The, it's a, yeah, it's a it's a type service. It's web type. Web type. Right? Okay, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, web type at webtype.com. Yeah. And I'm using they pre, their Franklin. They predated the uh, Google fonts, but it's the same idea. You, there th yeah, well, there's there's TypeKit, there's WebType, there's there's several um font deck, there's several really good services. You can also do it yourself. Um I like WebTypes Franklin. And I'm this actually serving it myself. Font. And you know what I love? Yeah. And maybe it's because you and I are old farts, but I love how big the text is. <laughs> well, yeah, I get, I, I hear that I'm too. sure people like, bitch like, that, oh my God, you're, look at the size of that. But boy, right. I bet it looks I, great I'll on get, mobile. Well, when I get to be your age, Mr. Seldman, I'll appreciate this too, I guess. <laughs> my dad likes it. <laughs> but you know, for years, the web was designed by 20-somethings and everything was so small. <laughs> and now those guys are 40. And so now, now they're, they're suddenly getting big again. <laughs> right. Totally, but totally. why? This is actually pretty large. Why? Why did you choose? I that? went overboard. Okay, so I went overboard with the size. Um, I actually think it's beautiful. I, I love. I it. wanted to make. I wanted to make the point that um, with uh, right with Retina and with you know super high resolution displays and gigantic desktops and all this, um, the one thing we know that scales beautifully is type. Yeah. And you know at Verdana. And Georgia, right, the two Matthew Carter Microsoft types that are on everybody's system, they're beautiful big. They're beautiful yeah. big. And then if you get, if you pick one of those and pick a really nice uh, typeface for your for your um, headlines, right, and, you know, and then you could actually create a pretty beautiful content experience that's a lot like, again, a lot like reading a book or like readability. I also wanted to make people sit back. So one of the things I love about my iPad, when I use an iPad, 
I feel like I'm more relaxed. Yeah. If I sit down at my laptop or my desktop, oh, I'm relax. working, man. I'm working. Yeah. If I if I sit on the couch and my kid's watching some kid movie and I'm sitting there with her pretending to watch with her, but I can sort of <laughs> surreptitiously glance at my phone or my thing, I right? I'm like relaxing and still, you know, answering emails. I read on the iPad and it's like reading a book which I hold back, hold right. at arm's length. Right. And I squint at websites now, the way websites are designed, and my eyes are fine, well, aside from the glasses, but I have to lean forward. Things are set so that you have to squint and lean forward, and I don't like that. I want people to feel relaxed when they read my site. I want them to actually sit back and read it like they do would with a book or a magazine or an yeah. iPad. So I picked, I deliberately set the type bigger than it needs to be so that they would sit back. Can I tell Please. you how great this looks on a Nexus 7, for instance? Look how Thank gorgeous you. that is. Thank That's you. That's just the right size. It's just and gorgeous. I, I removed everything. I mean, Well, I was going to say, there's no menus, there's no bar, there's nothing. It's just text. If you go to the footer, I put some, you know, there's some navigational items. <laughs> way, 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 yeah, way. Yeah, at the bottom way, where they way, shoot. Way, the, way. Oh. <laughs> I know. Right? But... If you want to contact Fine. me or something like that, you can find it. You that. can find it. And somebody in the chat room just said, oh, my God, I just realized this is the guy with the hat. Yes. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the guy. It's the I, guy I, with the hat. Thank you. Yeah, I don't actually, I don't actually wear it uh, in life that often. <laughs> yeah, if you had worn that, Jeffrey, we'd all know who you are. My, my seven-year-old daughter <laughs> wears it every night. Aww. She wears it every night to sleep. This is not a marketing thing. not my idea. She does it because it's... It, she can't sleep without it. It's her blue beanie. It's daddy. Daddy's. It's, it's daddy. It's, it's, you know she 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 puts that oh, on and then I read to her. I know. Oh my god! Kids change it all, don't they? Yeah. It really. Yeah. It why? Gives everything. Yeah. What you thought well, you knew, you do not. Uh, I was going to ask you more questions. Uh, oh, we were starting about tools, and I really I want to finish this. So uh, what do you use? Do you use Firefox's debugger? I use uh, BB Edit and TextMate to write HTML. Son of a... And, and I want to I wanna try Coda okay. uh, by Panic. I, I love it, Coda, yeah. too. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful. This is what I've heard. But you know um, what? If you're a BB Edit guy, you know, I think those that's a, that's a class apart. So do you speak. know? Do you know what I started with? Page Spinner. Did you ever hear I don't of that? Remember even remember Page Spinner? No. Page Spinner was a. It still exists before Dreamweaver. Yeah, before before Adobe bought Macromedia. Learn and master before. HTML with the HTML editor. It is not only does it still exist; it's apparently not high DPI. I might say. <laughs> so it is this one guy in Sweden or someplace who makes this. And I really liked supporting him for a long time, but it's only one guy. He can't. I think when I when I couldn't have an HTML5 doc type, I said, "Okay, I give up. Yeah. I give up." And I and I gave. But what I liked about it, it separated the content from the code as it should be. So, and it was actually in a different typeface, and the code was you could change the colors and all that stuff. And I liked that. I kind of hate having everything be. Um, and also, it had little buttons like. Uh, like Microsoft Word, where you could just like, Tap, you could select yeah. all your paragraphs. A toolbar, yeah. You could select all your paragraphs and hit the little P button, and all the and all of it, that would be done for you. And it, you know you could do that in WordPress, but you can't really do that in the tools that we use uh, for serious coding. And that, that I don't know why. So, but I, you know, it's been about five years since I used Page Spinner, uh, or you know, and God I bless think him, he's still doing it. now knowing that you actually might like Coda. Uh, a lot. Yeah. It's, okay. It, it's 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 similar a little bit to that. That sounds good. Yeah, and it, the Coda Two has a neat thing where you have an iPad and it renders the site on the iPad, so you almost have a dual screen experience. You have Coda on your desktop, and your iPad is rendering the page as you modify the CSS. So it's kind of an interesting way to do it. That sounds good. Yeah. That sounds good. I use Fetch for FTP. I, I paid for Transmit. Everybody loves Transmit. I never. I I, I just. It's great, but I couldn't let and it has. But I couldn't let go of Fetch for some you reason. You like the little running doggy. Maybe that was it. And I know and that. <laughs> and Xscope. Have you ever seen Xscope? Xscope sounds familiar. I don't. 
It's by Icon Factory, and it creates these little Icon tools Factory. that you could, yeah, it, these beautiful little tools. Like I'm look, I forget the width that I made something, uh, uh, but I so turn on this little ruler and measure it, or I don't, you know. Oh yeah, see, uh, I'm not a designer, so I wouldn't really need this, but I could see how this would it's be a wonderful. Great, it's yeah. a great tool for designers. Yeah. Um, and Photoshop, of course. Uh, and for writing, I I've been using Clean Text lately. Hmm. Clean Text removes everything. It's like uh, because uh, because why do you need it? There's a lot. Wait a minute. Of this is a web. This stuff. is a this is a web tool. This tool for writing. For writing. Mm. I don't know what Clean Text Org is. I think that's different. This is something else. Okay. That's something completely different. Clean text that for looks Mac. Like, oh, it's from a, uh, API Mac. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, More for me to download. Twitterific, Evernote, Last FM. Do you put I listen uh, to music all day long? Do you put um, Do you put uh, ideas and stuff in Evernote? Do you use that as kind of repository for snippets? Evernote and, ideas and Simple and, Note. Yep, Evernote yeah. and Simple Note. The thing about I love Evernote and I it's amazing. The one thing I don't like is it. It's WYSIWYG type, and then it gets that wrong. So some of the fonts at the beginning, you know, you'll select it, and it'll say Arial, but something isn't really Arial, and you'll say, well, since there's a drop-down, and it says Arial, perhaps I could change it to Helvetica. No, you can't. There's a drop-down with one item. A drop-down with one item. So the type, the font you're looking at, and then it's wrong. So, I, so when I get frustrated with that, I go to Simple Note, which is basically just text. And if I, you, you know... If uh, if I'm going to um, Simple Note is a is a Chrome plugin as well as an app. Yes, and it's kind and of it's a, and it's a brow- uh, it runs in the browser. Came very it's close cool. to replacing Evernote with Simple Note, uh, but you can't drag and drop photos yeah. into it like you can in Evernote and all that stuff. So I I, I love them both. They're you know both essential. Both Skype, Skype for, for podcasts. Uh, Font Explorer X Pro for type, although. I'm trying to use fewer and fewer fonts, so I may end up just using really? this system. Yeah. I mean, the, the... Fonts are a kind of bad habit. Yeah. It can disguise your lack of ideas, like everything else, like drop shadows and yeah. color. Everything everything can disguise your lack of ideas. So the more you can simplify it, just the better. everything Helvetica. And then you get sick of that. I, I once... <laughs> I like this Franklin. I think this is a really nice font. It was a Thank good, you. Yeah. good choice. It's really beautiful. David Burlow is uh, the type genius behind WebType and uh, other companies, and he recut every way to Franklin to Holy be cow. better on the screen. Holy cow! That's that's what, what he does. Wow. He's a, he's a you know he's a, a dangerous genius. He's just a brilliant guy. <laughs> I would love to do an hour with you on type alone. Uh, I find, I think that would be great. There are better people than me to do well, that. Well, there are some wizards. We'll have to find some type wizards. I just It just okay. hit me that we don't spend... People don't think about it a lot, and it's fast. It's actually very interesting. It's, it's half of design. Yeah. Jeffrey, what a pleasure talking to you. You do a podcast, uh, too. Tell me about that. I do, that. Leo. Um, I, so I do a thing called the Big Web Show. Well, it's been on a hiatus for a few weeks because just life has been crazy the last couple of weeks. But uh, the Big Web Show is a we call it everything web that matters, and uh, I I started it with Dan Benjamin and uh, as my co-host, and now I just do it alone. Uh, but I interview people who are doing interesting things on the web, whether that means they've created an app or they've got a you know an approach to design. You know, obviously. Luke Rabluski on mobile first, uh, Jeremy Keith on HTML5, Karen McGrain on responsive content or adapting ourselves to adaptive content. Um, and I'm in a lucky position in that with Eric Meyer, I run this conference in Event Apart. So I hear the best speakers and then I go, yeah, I should interview them on the show so everyone can hear that. Not everyone can come to the show, but everyone can hear the podcast. And then Maybe some of those people should write books. So I've got this sort of ecosystem now where the best speakers end up um, being interviewed on the show. That's democracy. Or maybe they write for a list apart that's free. That's democracy. And then maybe they come up with a book. And, you know, the books are 
you can read it, you know, you're flying from New York to Chicago and by the time you land in Chicago, you know why, you know, why design is a job or you understand how content strategy works or whatever. Right. They're sort of deep dives, but very narrowly, very crisply focused on particular topics. And I try to have interviews that, that can do the same with people who are, you know, kind of maniacally obsessed with one, you know, how to make responsive images work or whatever it happens to be. A lot of it, not so, it's less technical than a Jen Simmons show, I think. But, uh... One last question. Favorite, sure. con favorite content management system? Secretly, it's WordPress. For me. For, for my personal why, use. Why secretly? What's wrong? I mean, that's... Well, corporately, we use Expression Engine a lot. So this is great. Expression Engine is very powerful. And we use Expression Engine for magazines and client sites. But for me, with my roots in writing and, and, and blogs and stuff, which I've been doing for a long time, WordPress is perfect. And WordPress is actually capable of doing all kinds of advanced stuff. They just aren't, don't do a, you can do e-commerce with WordPress. They just don't do a very good job of letting people know all the things they're capable of. Um, no, I, I actually very much like, uh, we, yeah, use, I love, we use Drupal uh, for all of our uh, uh, sites and been very happy with it. But, yeah, uh, Drupal's very powerful. Yeah, yeah. Hey, what a pleasure, Jeffrey. Great to talk to you. Thanks, Leo. Uh, just, just really fun, interesting stuff. We'll have to do this again. That would be lovely. Thank the, you very much, sir. The guy in the blue beanie. I should introduce you that way right from the start. Then everybody would know. He's not wearing I, a hat. How do we know? I love that. I love that that guy sat through the hour. <laughs> he did. And he then, was listening. He was interested. Didn't know who I was. Oh, that's the guy in the blue beanie. Yeah. Did, did you want it? Is Blue Beanie Day uh, uh, ongoing? Is that still? Yeah. In uh, November, we'll do Blue Beanie Day again. It'll be the sixth. And it's for web standards. Yeah, you put on the blue beanie for web standards. Ridiculous. <laughs> it's you know it caught on. It did it. It yeah. worked. It did it. And. uh and I'll tell you when we'll have you on next is when they come up, and I know they will, with a replacement for SOPA, we'll get you back on to talk about uh, talk about Brilliant. That. Thanks very much, Thank sir. Thank you, Jeffrey. Take care. Zeldman.com. This show is all about great minds, great people, great thoughts, interesting conversations. We do triangulation every Wednesday, uh, about 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, 2200 UTC on twit.tv. I do love it when you watch live. As you can see, we pay attention to the chat room. We interact with the chat room, and it's very helpful. But uh, if you can't watch live, on-demand versions are always available of everything we do, both audio and video. You'll find them on twit.tv, in this case, twit.tv slash TRI. Uh, or, of course, you know, the best thing to, probably to do is if you have a place that you subscribe to podcasts like iTunes or the Zoom Marketplace or Dogcatcher or Instacast, whatever it is that you do. If you would subscribe, I would be very grateful. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next Wednesday on Triangulation. <laughs>